So tonight, tonight I want to I want to give you um, a, a real, a quite formal lecture um, on what's called the religion of no religion, but which more of you would be familiar with as the spiritual but not religious uh, worldview. And and my basic goal here tonight is to explain to you why, uh, certainly in its origins and certainly in its its sort of logical structure or theology, this is not a fuzzy worldview. This is not. This is a very serious uh, intellectual position that. Uh, people are taken today, often without any understanding of where it comes from or, or its radicalism, really. But, but my goal here tonight is to kind of give you a sense for where this comes from and to help you uh, uh, appreciate it more. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just begin. This evening I want to talk about the religion of no religion in two different modes. In the first mode, I want to address the religion of no religion philosophically or theologically. That is, I want to describe it as a kind of super logic or unconscious operating system that different historical figures and communities over the centuries have expressed, if never, of course, articulated in quite this way. In the second mode, I want to address the religion of no religion historically and culturally. That is, I want to describe very briefly the background of this orientation in the general history of religions and in a most recent cultural expression of it, the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. It was Esalen that spawned the human potential movement of the 1960s and 70s, which in turn helped seed the more popular New Age movement of the 1980s and 90s. Finally, I will end with a few comments about the American legal system, um, about the very real dilemmas of religious tolerance embedded in this category, and about that immense demographic of Americans below the age of 30 who now describe themselves as spiritual but not religious. So I have many goals this evening, and we only have five hours. <laughs> so uh, let us move quickly. Part one, the super logic of the religion of no religion. Let me begin with what the religion of no religion is not. The religion of no religion is not secularism. Although as we will see, it depends upon a robustly secular society to flourish. Similarly, the religion of no religion is not atheism. Although particular expressions of the religion of no religion may well be atheistic, and any religion of no religion will call into serious question the images of God that the typical believer assumes. So if the religion of no religion is not secularism or atheism, what is it? First and foremost, the religion of no religion is an implicit theory of religion and the religious imagination. Whether or not a particular figure or tradition articulates such a theory, this deep super logic is in fact a radical way of understanding religion that simultaneously affirms and denies the symbolic expressions of the different religions. It affirms tradition, belief, and community as intimate, necessary, and creative responses to some original inbreaking of the sacred some past revelation or enlightenment event. But it also insists that such expressions are always local and relative. In its more radical moments, the religion of no religion also insists that such inbreakings are not simply past, that new and different ones are potential and possible right now, right here. A kind of endless religious creativity is affirmed then with no revelation or enlightenment event getting to claim itself as the last or final word. They do, of course, anyway, but that is not the religion of no religion. That is religion. It is very important at this juncture to emphasize both the positive and negative poles of such an understanding. As a theory of the religious imagination, the religion of no religion insists on the beauty and even truth of what is expressed and on the relative or local nature of that expression. 
We might say that its view of religion is essentially an artistic one, as long as we are willing to consider art, symbol, and myth as mediums of genuine truths that cannot be expressed in any other way. To borrow an image from my colleague, Marcia Brennan, religion becomes here a kind of curating of consciousness with the painter, the paint, and the painted understood to be all connected moments in an astonishing form of consciousness curating itself in the codes and material objects of public culture. That is a non-dual and frankly mind-bending way to express the matter, although I think it captures very accurately what we actually see in many extreme religious events, particularly those we today <clears throat> call paranormal. But that is another story. <clears throat> If we wish to be more ordinary and dualistic about the matter at hand, we might say that such a view of religion is simply a function of the manner in which the human psyche mediates, translates, and filters our experience of reality. Something is coming through, we might say. But if there is in fact a something, there is also and always a coming through. To say that something is coming through or mediated is to acknowledge both the something and the mediating process. And by acknowledging this, we will find ourselves affirming and denying each and every religious tradition. That is the basic moral paradox of the religion of no religion. Historically speaking, the origins of any religion of no religion inevitably lie in personal, and often extremely dramatic mystical and visionary experiences. These are the psychodynamic base of the religion of no religion, which in turn produce any number of doctrines within a particular historical expression or coming through. These doctrines are generally Gnostic in orientation, by which I mean three things. I mean that they emerge from actual or empirical experiences of the, of the divine within specific individuals. Secondly, I mean that these events often involve the realization of the divine human. That is, they locate divinity in and as human being. And thirdly, I mean that the exponents of, of a religion of no religion often end up deconstructing simplistic notions of God out there. That is, any dualistic image of God that posits a divinity separate from human nature. Not every instance of the religion of no religion, of course, explicitly advances all three doctrines. Moreover, such realizations are usually embedded and expressed in elaborate mythological, doctrinal, and ritual contexts, few of which can really work for us today. Hence the crucial importance of the modern movements. Okay, part two. I am fully aware of how abstract that all sounded. <laughs> Allow me then to put some flesh on these bones, as it were, with three historical examples. So we'll get, we'll get meaty now from here on out. We, we just went through the tough part. Um, our first example, I'm gonna give you three examples, but I'm not gonna tell you who they were um, until the end. Our first example was a famous academic and preacher who begged his listeners, quote, to take leave of God for God. That is to abandon their naive notions of God as an objective person out there. He could thus preach lines like this one, quote, simple people imagine that they should see God as if he stood there and they here. That is not so. God and I, we are one in knowledge, unquote. By knowledge, this man did not mean belief or some rationally argued thesis. He meant direct and immediate mystical experience. He meant what I have just named gnosis. True again to the triple gnosis of the religion of no religion, he taught the divinization of human nature. In his own Christian terms, the incarnation for him was not a single past event, but an eternal reality or process that is constantly taking place in the human soul outside space and time. He thus considered human nature, as opposed to the human ego, to be divine. Listen. I say humanity and man are different. 
Humanity in itself is so noble that the highest peak of humanity is equal to the angels and akin to God. The closest union that Christ had with the Father, that is possible for me to win, could I but slough off what there is of this and that and realize my humanity. True again to the triple gnosis, at the ground of all this man's teachings was a basic distinction that he drew between God and the Godhead beyond God. God is the personal deity that comes into being when human beings pray or worship. We, we literally create God. The Godhead is not this. Indeed, one of his most common descriptions of this Godhead beyond God was nicked or nothing. By such a provocation, he did not mean nothing in the nihilistic sense. He meant that the Godhead was beyond space and time and so could not be identified with any single thing or, lo or act located in space and time. The Godhead is literally no thing. He also referred to this nothing as the eternal now. There is neither time nor space in the eternal now. That is exactly why it is immortal and infinite. That is also why there can be no ego there. There is, as he put it, neither Henry nor Conrad there. As egos, of course, as Henry's and Conrad's, we can hardly understand such things. But we can well recognize the religion of no religion in this man's God beyond God. Our second figure, like our first, was a trained philosopher. Because of his own direct mystical experiences and visions, he considered himself to be the seal of the saints, that is the greatest of them all. And he suggested that the saints know more than the prophets did. The lore around this astonishing figure contained numerous stories of what we would today recognize as clairvoyance, mind reading, telepathy, even materialization and teleportation. He wrote many books which included famous lines like these. If a Gnostic is really a Gnostic, he cannot stay tied to one form of belief. He will not remain trapped in one belief. He accepts all kinds of beliefs, but does not remain tied to any figurative or symbolic belief. Or again, beware of being bound up by a particular religion and rejecting all others as unbelief. If you do that, you will fail to obtain a great benefit. Nay, you will fail to obtain the true knowledge of reality. Try to make yourself a kind of prime matter or putty for all forms of religious belief. God is wider and greater than to be confined to a particular religion to the exclusion of others. Echoing our religion of no religion, this same man had a name for the ability to shape the prime matter or putty of the soul to curate consciousness in and through all the relative figures of religious belief. He called this state of consciousness the station of no station. Our third figure taught at a school you will recognize, Harvard Divinity School, where he once gave a famous sermon. In this sermon, this man denied the unique divinity of Christ affirmed the divinity of the infinite soul, that is of us, and celebrated the revelations of individual religious experience in the present and future. He called on his listeners, quote, to live with the privilege of the immeasurable mind, unquote, and move beyond what he called historical Christianity, an institution whose worship of Jesus as the only divine human being and idolatrous reliance on the Bible as somehow final, he found particularly odious. What he wanted was an individualized form of spirituality that is fundamentally open to present and future revelations and not just past ones. The goal of the religious life for him was not Christianity, it was what he called consciousness. By consciousness, he did not mean the ego or ordinary awareness. He did not mean what I think we're all in at the moment. Um, he meant something much grander. He meant something fundamentally cosmic. Hence, he would write lines like this. Man is a stream whose source is hidden. Our being is descending into us from we know not whence. 
or in one of his most famous lines, itself based on his own mystical experiences again, he wrote, all mean egotism vanishes. I became or I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or particle of God. So there are three examples of the religion of no religion. Who were they? Our first figure was a medieval German professor whom we now call Meister Eckhart. He died in 1328. His birth name was Eckhart von Hochheim. Meister was an academic title that meant simply master. We would today say Professor Eckhart. Our second example was Ibn al-Arabi, a Muslim mystic and philosopher who was active in the 12th and 13th centuries and who was born in cosmopolitan Spain. Our third example was Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great Bostonian transcendentalist. So that is what the religion of no religion looks like historically, a paradoxical theology created by trained intellectuals and professors out of their own mystical experiences. I should add that such a way of speaking of God and religion has not been terribly well received by the religions. Meister Eckhart was put on trial as he was dying, and many of his teachings were, teachings were subsequently condemned by the papacy. The man died a harassed author. Ibn al-Arabi's disciples called their master the reviver of religion. His critics called him the killer of religion. One Egyptian ruler was so upset with what Ibn al-Arabi wrote that he tied one of his books to the tail of a dog. Nor have the condemnations stopped. The Egyptian government banned this man's books as late as the 1970s, and they are still blacklisted to this day in Saudi Arabia. As for Ralph Waldo Emerson, within a few weeks of his Harvard sermon, the local Boston press was filled with vehement attacks Charges of atheism, insult, and blasphemy flew. He was expelled from Harvard for 25 years. He would become Ralph Waldo Emerson, as we know him today, precisely by leaving the church, not by being some sort of good Christian. As my colleague April DeConnick recently pointed out in a lecture of her own, Emerson's resignation letter actually hangs here in Houston in a library of another kind of church named after him, Emerson Unitarian. All three men, of course, lived in intensely religious social contexts in which there was little secular room for the nuanced worldview that they were espousing with such precision and provocation. What does such a religious orientation look like when the social and legal contexts are more secular? when people of such convictions are no longer afraid for their safety or their livelihoods? What happens when the mystical theology that is the religion of no religion becomes a broad-based social movement in a secularizing society? Part three, Esalen. This I want to suggest is exactly what has happened over the last two centuries in American culture. So, we can start almost anywhere in American history. We could start, for example, with the man who first used the word spirituality in its modern sense. The poet Walt Whitman in 1871 in his Democratic Vistas, to be exact. Before Whitman, nobody had used the word spirituality in, in the way we use it today. It, was un it existed, but it meant something completely different. Here is the very first occurrence of that oh-so-modern word. Whitman wrote that only in the perfect uncontamination and solitariness of individuality may the spirituality of religion come forth at all. Whitman expressed this same spiritual individualism in his greatest poem, Leaves of Grass. Leaves here functioning as a metaphor for religious scriptures which for Whitman are real revelations that emerge from us and must someday fall off or be shed. 
Listen to the great bard sing as he affirms and denies the religions at the same time. We consider the Bibles and religions divine. I do not say they are not divine. I say they have all grown out of you and may grow out of you still. It is not they who give the life. It is you who give the life. Leaves are not more shed from the trees or trees from the earth than they are shed out of you. We can easily find the same Whitmanian, Whitmanian themes in the advertised subject of my lecture this evening. Esalen uh, was founded in the fall of 1962. Assumptions aside, it was not a child of the counterculture. Indeed, it well predated the counterculture. Its most immediate intellectual, spiritual, and psychological roots reached back to the 1950s. To the, to the experiences of its two founders, Michael Murphy and the late Richard Price. Both men had breakout spiritual experiences in the 1950s. Price's occurred in the North Beach District of San Francisco through Buddhist meditation and beat culture. Murphy's occurred in a college classroom with a professor of comparative religion named Frederick Spiegelberg. Indeed, both Price and Murphy studied with Professor Spiegelberg. Both men were graduates of Stanford. Spiegelberg's own story is well worth dwelling on for a moment, as it was Spiegelberg who coined the phrase, the religion of no religion, that I have borrowed as my own for this evening. It will probably not surprise you to learn that Spiegelberg's coining of the phrase was a later intellectual framing of a profound mystical experience that he had known as a young man in 1917. At that point in time, he was studying medieval Latin theology, which no doubt included Professor Eckhart, at the University of Halle. One bright spring day during this time, the young man took a walk through a wheat field laced with blue cornflowers and red poppies. As he walked through the field, he writes his quote, usual everyday consciousness vanished, and he felt instead something deep, something holy. He calls this other being his higher self. Within this altered state of consciousness, he now, quote, sees the bright glance of some super cosmic sun shining from the center of every creature around him, unquote. All of reality has become perfect and holy, he describes. What he calls secular life has faded away. Then while still enjoying this cosmic presence in everything that is, something stops him in his tracks, something both traditionally religious and deeply disturbing. And I'm gonna hear, let him speak. He's speaking in the third person, but this is Spiegelberg. He suddenly approaches around the corner of the road, a church, and the sight of the church gives him a shock. For what on earth is a church doing in his glorified world? What can be behind these stone walls? What means this colored light behind the windows? And what these strange sounds of music which reach his ears? All the world around has been holy, has been God's eternal nature, has been his face and his expression. Therefore, and this is what shocks him, if there is really anything else, anything peculiar behind those walls, it could only be a matter outside God, in contrast with, or even in opposition to, this eternal bliss of the all-penetrating holiness. Now such a feeling and such an experience, Spiegelberg goes on to tell his readers, has always meant one thing, the birth of the religion of no religion. Such a religion of no religion must deny the gods and the churches, but not for the sake of denial or some angry anti-religious platform. After all, the entire natural universe is divine. It makes no more sense to bow down to a Lord in the clouds than it does to build a church in the midst of a shimmering divine conscious wheat field. Everything that is, is holy. Paradoxically then, this denial of the gods, of the church, and of every accepted notion of God leads always to the conception of what he calls new names for God. 
The religion of no religion, in other words, is not the end of religion. Rather, it is the beginning of new types of religion, a kind of creative void that denies the old in order to create the new. It is the ground at once full and empty of the history of religions. As with our other three exponents of the religion of no religion, it is surely no accident that the man who inspired the founders of Eslin was also a political refugee from Nazi Germany. Frederick was no fuzzy thinker or dilettante. He was a radical theologian, a friend of Paul Tillich and Martin Heidegger, whose public speeches and writings were trapped, tracked by the Nazi thought police and who had to flee for his life from his own home. It was this religion of no religion, it was this radical intellectual that Michael Murphy and Dick Price learned at Stanford University in the 1950s. They also learned about the Upanishads and Hinduism, about Tibetan Buddhism, Sufism, and Neoplatonism. Not surprisingly, both men dedicated themselves to a contemplative practice Murphy's Hindu in accent, Price's Buddhist, neither quite traditional. Both men also went through life-changing events around 1956. Dick had suffered his way through a psychotic break, an enlightenment experience that was shut down by brutal psych psychiatric intervention. He was basically imprisoned in a psychiatric institution for 16 months and given almost 70 electric and chemical shock treatments to, to bring him back to normality. Murphy spent 16 months in India where he lived in the ashram of Sri Aurobindo, a psychically gifted writer who had envisioned evolution as both a biological and an, and an occult process that was leading to what he called alternately the supermind or the Gnostic Superman. This, by the way, was well before the guy with the cape and blue and red tights, but it was well after Nietzsche. In any case, here at the core of Murphy's founding vision for Eslin, we encounter the divinization of the human being again, big time. Above all, though, Eslin would come to be about something called the human potential. This is probably the key of the whole thing. The phrase, was drawn directly from the writings of Aldous Huxley, the great uh, British-American novelist and essayist. The phrase, uh, human, the human potential, captured a broad band of ideas and practices whose basic claim for Huxley and for, for Mike and Dick was that human beings possess immense, untapped reservoirs of consciousness and energy that cultures have repressed in different ways, but that we today can actualize and develop into a more integral vision of an evolving supernature, ours. Behind Huxley's notion of human potentialities laid another key idea, namely that the brain is not the producer of mind, but its filter, receiver, reducer, and transmitter. By the way, it's important to know that Aldous came from a very distinguished scientific family. His, his grandfather, T.H. Huxley, was the defender of Darwin, and his brother, Julian, was a great uh, a biologist. So he's, he, he's well aware of, of the science. In this model, often called the filter thesis, the trick becomes how to alter or suppress the brain filter so that mind can shine into the body brain and reveal itself for what it is cosmic and probably immortal. What we might call the three Ps came to dominate the answers about how to suppress brain for the sake of this supermind or cosmic spirit. Those three Ps were psychology, psychical research, and psychedelics. Countless other therapies, meditation techniques, and teachings would follow over the next five decades. Um, but, but many of them had the same basic logic, how, how to shut down or how to suppress normal brain function so that other forms of mind can come on. And of course, the most common one is just meditation, which is the same, same sort of principle.
but there were other um, sometimes more effective ways too. The Institute has had an indirect but profound influence on American culture. Many of the practices and ideas the Institute stood for virtual, virtually alone in 1962, from meditation and yoga to the synthesis of evolutionary biology and theology are now common features of American public culture. Looked at most broadly, one might locate four general uh, periods in this history. The social conservatism of the 1950s, the counterculture of the 60s and 70s, the rise of the religious right in the 1980s and 90s, and our own critical present, tottering between conservatism and liberalism before the specters of fundamentalism and terrorism. The counterculture certainly did not appear out of nowhere. It was a creative reaction against the sheer fear and stunted staidness of what Henry Miller had called the air-conditioned nightmare of American society in the 1950s. Think violent racial segregation, unquestioned gender roles, McCarthyism, and the backyard bomb shelter. The 60s thus gave us the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the sexual revolution, psychedelia, rock and roll, early gay rights, and a new fascination with Asian religions. There were, of course, as many casualties as causes here. The baby boomers mellowed and matured, and the unprecedented freedoms this era released were too much for too many too soon. Hence the birth of the counter counterculture that is the rise of the religious right in the 80s and 90s. And then I have a section here on really the grandfather of all of this uh, was, was actually Henry Miller. Uh, Henry Miller was this banned uh, erotic author who moved into Big Sur and who hung out at early Esalen. Uh, and at one point, uh, he, used to, he used to joke, people would ask him how they, people could buy his books and he said, well, just visit any port and go to, the, go to the building where they keep all the confiscated goods, and that's where all of his books were. Um, at one point, there were no less than 41 legal battles being fought over Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer. And it was these legal battles that uh, eventually, uh, the, other, the other text here was Allen Ginsberg's Howell, uh, by the way, and it was a result of these legal battles that this whole category of obscenity uh, was eliminated from our, our legal system. And this is what laid the legal foundations for the beat generation, the counterculture, and the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 70s. So it was fought out in the courts, essentially, before it really sort of exploded in the culture. The first seminar in Big Sur at Esalen took place on September 22nd and 23rd in 1962. The next few years brought in their wake a dizzying display of names. <clears throat> These included Alan Watts, the, the Buddhist teacher, Arnold Toynbee, the philosopher, Paul Tillich, the theologian, Gregory Bateson, the great uh, biologist who actually lived at Esalen for a number of years, Ansel Adams, the photographer, Fritz Perls, the psychologist, Abraham Maslow, Ida Rolf, the, the rolfer, uh, Timothy Leary, uh, Richard Alpert, who became Ram Dass, Ken Casey, J.B. Ryan, um, the parapsychologist, B.F. Skinner, the great behaviorist, Carl Rogers, Rollo May, Buckminster Fuller, and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, to name just a few. Bizarrely, a young Hunter Thompson, who had not yet written a book, was the gate guard, believe it or not. This was, until that is, he got into a fight with some gay men in the baths. They beat the crap out of him. And he responded by shooting out the windows in the Murphy's vacation home where he was living. That was the end of Hunter Thompson at, at, at Esalen. The list of topics and ideas was dizzying, but there was a theology and a psychology creating the space for all of this to happen. Spiegelberg's religion of no religion, which allowed them to look fairly and sympathetically at any religion, any religious idea and Huxley's human potentialities, which helped them to psychologize all of this and think about this in a very theoretical sense. Then there were the folk festivals organized by Joan Baez, who, who lived at Esalen as well. The pop stars, 
George Harrison and Ringo Starr actually landed on the front lawn of Esalen in their own private helicopter at one point. Uh, and we could go on and on. I could, I could go on and on all night telling you stories and dropping names. Um, we can maybe do that in the fourth and fifth hour. The, pl the place was, as we say, happening. Um, I, 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 we can't do that, obviously, and we're not going to do that. Um, I wrote 500 pages on this, this history, and I failed there, so we're not going to complete it tonight. Let me just tell you one story from this Esalen history. I, I've selected it for two reasons. First, because it's often said that uh, the spiritual but not religious crowd somehow have no social sense. They don't care about social or political issues. It's clearly false. And this story uh, displays that quite stunningly. And second, because this particular Esalen story uh, climaxes just outside of Houston uh, in Clear Lake. So it's a, it's a local story as well. It was during the 1970s and the height of the Cold War that Esalen began its diplomatic ventures into the Soviet Union. The key figure here was a woman named Dulce Murphy, Michael's wife. Dulcie led these programs for decades and still runs an institute for the same in Mill Valley. No one in the late 1960s would have guessed that such a thing would ever have been possible. Indeed, it appears that the Nixon administration tried to bring Esalen down by linking it to the Charles Manson murders. Abigail Folger, the coffee heiress who was among the murdered, had attended an Esalen seminar and Sharon Tate happened to be at Esalen the night before the gruesome uh, events. But there simply was no causal link between Esalen and the Manson crimes. Indeed, if the memory of one former Esalen staff member I interviewed is correct, Manson himself had been refused entrance to the grounds a few weeks before the events unfolded. He was just too scary and weird. That was the Nixon era. Both the Carter and the Reagan administration supported Esalen's diplomatic efforts with the Soviet Union, if always behind the scenes. What is so interesting here is, again, what we might call the mystical origins of this political activity, really psychical origins. The Esalen activists were initially drawn to the Soviet Union largely because of its parapsychological research programs. And many of their initial contacts there were parapsychologists, mediums, psychics, and mystics. A particular fascination here was the orthodox trope of theosis, or human divinization again. Once in the Soviet Union, the same Esalen figures quickly learned that they could do other things, things that uh, official governments could not do. Such efforts included things like attending and giving speeches at the 1980 Olympics in Moscow, with a wink and a nod from the Carter administration that had boycotted the same Olympics, or attending photo shoots featuring an American Apollo astronaut, Rusty Schweikert, and the personal faith healer of Leonid Brezhnev, or engaging in telepathic experiments from Moscow to San Francisco with their Russian friends, uniting in mind what had become separated by national politics or working with Steven Wozniak of Apple Computers to organize the first space bridge for a double rock concert that was staged in San Bernardino in Moscow and then projected via satellite on huge screens. Basically, they, they got a bunch of kids in San Bernardino in Moscow and they brought in these bands and they filmed them and, and then beamed, beamed the Moscow kids to the American kids and the American kids to the Moscow kids. So it was a really deeply symbolic uh, thing. No one thought it would work. No one thought the Russians would, would uh, even acknowledge it. Turns out it was on the nightly news, uh, probably because the, one of the bands they, uh, they um, staged was Men at Work. So there's a, there's a kind of socialist theme there. Um, um, Dulce and, and, and Michael lived in Moscow for months at a time, not as protected diplomats, but as guests and neighbors in real neighborhoods, where they became close friends of journalists, scientists, and activists of all sorts. This was at the very nadir of the Cold War. Those of you who remember that, probably almost everyone in this room, it was a very dark time. Um, back at home, the Esalen actors would lead the charge to, to bring Russian writers, scientists, artists, and high-ranking government officials to America to see for themselves that Americans were not all evil imperialists. 
It was all this that gave Esalen a real reputation in Washington. Uh, hence, when Stephen Reinsmith was appointed by President Reagan in 1986 to facilitate Russian-American exchanges, he was told immediately that it needed to go to Esalen. That, after all, was where the real diplomatic action was going on. Almost done. How about this story? Such effects bore dramatic fruit in 1989, when Esalen was chosen to sponsor Boris Yeltsin's trip to America where the politician was converted to capitalism in a Houston grocery store, probably a Randall's in Clear Lake. They wouldn't answer my call. Randall's wouldn't. Apparently, there are no historians at Randall's grocery store. <laughs> so I, I, I can only speculate that it was a Randall's. There, in the grocery store, the last remnant of his Bolshevism dissolved before a plethora of brightly lit fruits, vegetables, meats, and a single shopping woman who answered Boris's polite questions about how much of her <coughs> monthly income she spent on such spectacular groceries. Yeltsin realized immediately that her answer represented a mere fraction of what Russians were spending on very poor food in very long lines back at home. Yeltsin's aides have identified that moment in that grocery store as the turning point in Yeltsin's political life. He quit the party after that American visit. His stereotypes of both America and capitalism had been completely shattered. He had been told, for example, that the Statue of Liberty looked like a witch and that people in New York lived in crime-ridden slums. But the Lady of Liberty was quite beautiful. He flew around her in a helicopter. The New York streets were friendly and bright, and even its slums, Boris commented, could pass for decent housing in the Soviet Union. <laughs> a few months later, Boris Yeltsin was standing on a tank in front of the Russian parliament building. The rest is, as we say, history. A side note, as I was writing this lecture, I received an email from my colleagues at Esalen who were contacted by an exhibition planning firm in New York City that is designing a museum for the Boris Yeltsin Presidential Center in Russia. They were asking about photos of Boris in the Randall's grocery store. <laughs> okay, conclusion, we're almost done here, folks. Much has happened since 1989, of course, but we are out of time. For the rest, I say, go read the book. But what to say at the end of our evening together? I have four quick things I wanna get on the table for you about the American legal context of our present religion of no religion, about the very real dilemmas of religious tolerance that the, that the religion of no religion represents, about the role that the comparative study of religion has played in all of this, and about the spiritual but not religious youth culture. Okay, so these, these will go quickly. First of all, the American legal context. The first thought I would like to leave you with is, this evening is the suggestion that Esalen's religion of no religion is both very ancient and very new. Rooted in a very extensive knowledge and appreciation of comparative mystical literature and the history of religions, the founding and flourishing of Esalen has also been a deeply American phenomenon. Its religion of no religion is deeply American because it encodes in theological form one of the core principles of the American Constitution, the separation of church and state. In America, after all, anyone can be religious in almost any way precisely because there is no religion. That is, there is no official religion. Not supposed to be anyway. Uh, every American religion is in this technical sense a religion of no religion. That is, every religion can flourish precisely because no one gets to speak for everyone else. This same separation of church and state is also, of course, why the religion of no religion can flourish today, whereas it was more or less restricted to perse persecuted intellectuals and professors in previous centuries, as we have seen. It is not, of course, the case that American secularism or the Constitution produced the religion of no religion. I'm not arguing that. It is that this secularism and that this Constitution allows it to be expressed in public and in freedom. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a generation or a generous thing. It's not a productive thing. Seen in this light, America becomes a truly subversive 
mystical ideal, precious few religious traditions, with the possible exception of groups like the Quakers and the Unitarians seem to be aware of this. Few realize that the deepest theological and social implications of democracy are far more radical than any society, including our own, has dared to realize. Secondly, the dilemmas of religious tolerance. It is here that I think we need to come to terms with what we have called, mostly for lack of a better expression, religious tolerance. We might define religious tolerance as the civic virtue of not attempting to suppress religious worldviews that compete with, contradict, or even deny those of the majority worldview. Both religious tolerance and religious freedom are central to most liberal societies, of course, but it should also be recognized that both civic virtues come with very heavy religious costs. Religious tolerance, after all, boils down to a willingness to not act on one's own religious beliefs. But religious revelations and states of enlightenment are not experienced or transmitted as options to believe or not to believe. They intervene with overwhelming power and force into the lives of individuals and communities and make ultimate, universal, absolute truth claims. The problem, of course, that there is, have not been one or two of these revelations and salvations, but hundreds, if not actually thousands, right? So for example, when, uh, you know, in the Exodus story, God didn't uh, appear to Moses and carve the law onto the rock and the law didn't say, well, maybe do this or maybe do that, then please get along with the Egyptians. No, I didn't say that at all. Or when the Buddha preached that none of us have a soul, there is no self, he didn't mean just people in North India don't have a soul or self, he means no one does. So these are, these are absolute truth claims that are, that are being made. We have to acknowledge this basic problem of religious pluralism and the fundamental incompatibility of religious teachings. We need to stop pretending otherwise. Religions, to the extent that they make universal claims about the human condition, are structurally intolerant. That is their logic or unconscious operating system. If we are ever going to solve our religious problems, we will have to address those deep operating systems. We will have to rewrite them, or short of that, learn to handle them with more nuance and sophistication. It is a basic mismatch between our own modern values and those of the ancient worlds that produce these religions that is the real problem here. We thus tend to think today of religious tolerance and religious freedom as nice virtues that are self-evident and come without cost, when in fact they directly contradict and seriously undermine each and every strong religious claim. The Roman Catholic priest then had it exactly right when he said this about the comparative religion college of the 16th century Indian Mughal Emperor Akbar. The priest wrote, the king cares little that in allowing everyone to follow his or her own religion, he was in reality violating all. The priest was correct, as is every fundamentalist who says more or less the same thing today. We do not, of course, have to agree with the specific answers of the Catholic priest or the contemporary fundamentalist, but I do think we have to acknowledge the costs of religious tolerance that they are all accurately identifying. Obviously, I'm all for religious tolerance, all for religious freedom, but I think we have to acknowledge what it is and what we're actually saying. This is where the religion of no religion comes in, as it is a religious position that fully understands what's being asked and meets this challenge as a religious problem. It does not tinker with surface things as if we can just politely ignore our obvious differences or not read all of those very painful passages in the scriptures. No, it meets all of this head on, goes deep and reprograms the operating system itself. Please note that the religion of no religion is not a multiple choice test. It is not a choice for this or that religion, nor is it some innocent act of religious tolerance or an expression of anything goes. Rather, it represents a fundamental change of the rules of the religious game. It is a reprogramming of the unconscious operating system that has been running our cultures and our religious egos for millennia.
This is, this is very serious business. The comparative study of religion. Obviously, if such a project is to be successful, and it may well fail, this is going to take a long time. I would suggest, suggest though, that we have already begun such a project, whether we recognize it as such or not. Let me admit here what is probably already obvious to you by now, namely that what I have called the religion of no religion looks suspiciously like the comparative study of religion in the universities today. The professional comparative study of religion need not be a re religion of no religion or vice versa, of course, but there are real and obvious resonances here. There are also very real historical connections. As you now know, the religion of no religion was coined by a professor of comparative religion, who in turn inspired the founding of Esalen. One could hardly ask for a more obvious example. But this kind of academic gnosis is hardly restricted to the history of Esalen. Indeed, much of the modern study of religion can be thought of as a rationalized expression of the kinds of social activisms and countercultural mysticisms that have flowed through American life in the last 60 years. In effect, the altered states of the counterculture became the altered states or altered categories of the university. It is no accident, for example, that the explosion of comparative religion in American universities coincide exactly with the counterculture and its famous turn east. I, 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 if this place was founded in the 1970s, it's, it's in the same zone, same cultural zone. Nor is it an accident that race, class, and gender have come to define much of the humanities. These, after all, were precisely the concerns of the 1960s via the civil rights movement, the sexual revolution, the prominence of Marxist thought, and the birth of feminist and gay consciousness in that still reverberating decade. <clears throat> to the extent that intellectuals and citizens still insist on placing these forms of thought at the very heart of our culture, they still inhabit what is essentially a countercultural state of consciousness. Fourth and finally, the spiritual but not religious. This is no longer just about the academy or the counterculture, of course. This is no longer about condemned medieval theologians, rejected Muslim mystics, banned Harvard intellectuals, or radical theologians fleeing Nazi Germany. This is about a broad-based religious orientation that has become the dominant moniker in the youth culture of today. This is the worldview for uh, our, our children. Um, a young woman recently showed me uh, her um, page on um, Match.com. Just to be clear, this was my daughter. Not uh, and, and you click what your religious orientation is, and, and uh, hers said spiritual but not religious. And I said, well, did you make that up? And she said, no, Dad, that, that was a box. So, I mean, this, this is where we're at. This is where this culture is. Um, <clears throat> the religion of no religion has become the spiritual but not religious. That's, that's what it is right now. I confess that I am guardedly hopeful about all of this. The future remains, of course, uncertain and largely dependent on the choices that we make now. I hope that you take away this evening the happy conclusion that there are always more than two choices, that we do not need to choose between nihilism and fundamentalism or between secularism and spirit. We are much bigger and smarter than that. There is a third way. Like Ralph Waldo Emerson, we can choose to be concerned about consciousness and not Christianity or Judaism or Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism or, or whatever the box is. We can choose our shared divine humanity over our constructed and relative religious egos. We can also shed the leaves of our religious scriptures just as easily as we once grew them. Certainly, Esalen's religion of no religion has given witness to all of this, even if its consciousness has not yet become culture, even if it remains only a utopian hope. Such a vision has captured the hearts of our youth in another form. We would do well, I think, to listen to them. We would also do well to remind them that they are hardly the first to draw these conclusions and that the religion of no religion has existed in many cultures and many centuries before us, waiting for a time and a place to come into its own in public and in freedom. Whether that place and time is here and now remains 
to be seen, we will see. Thank you very much.